My name is Mark Fisher. I am the president and co-owner of Plan for Life, along with my partner Danica Zick, in the back here. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, event here. Uh, our firm is a financial planning firm with a couple of specialties. Uh, one is in the area of maximizing Social Security, and the other is income and retirement planning. What we're talking about today is really three different things. One is amazing talent, which we're actually going to see today. The second is total commitment, which we're also going to see today. And the third I want to mention is the generosity. Very appreciative that Billy was able to come and join us today. And um, I would like to introduce him right now. My name's Billy McLaughlin, and I wasn't born with a guitar in my hands, but from the first time I picked it up when I was about 12 years old, I never wanted to put it down. They say you get the best at whatever you do the most, and what I wanted to do the most was play my guitar. Practice never really felt like work to me, and I practiced a lot. By the time I was 15, I was already in the recording studio. Wheels of Fortune, take one. My parents were relieved to hear that I'd enrolled in college, a little less relieved to find out that I was going to be in a school of music, but despite their concerns, I graduated with honors. I never wanted to sound like anybody else, so I developed some unorthodox skills on the guitar, and that's really what helped me establish my signature sound. fun part of music is getting out and playing for people and that's why I spent years and years touring nationally from the east coast of the US to the west coast building my fan base and winning some awards along the way. I knew if I followed my dreams and did the hard work that eventually the record industry would notice and almost 20 years to the day that I started playing guitar I signed an international recording contract with the Virgin Records Group. My first release made it to the Billboard Top 10. I remember waking up one day realizing that I was at the top of my field and I was playing alongside guitar players that I considered to be legendary. They say you get the best at whatever you do the most, and I just had no idea that what I loved to do the most and what I was the best at would soon become impossible for me. I had no idea I was about to lose everything. Musicians don't, you know, work because they need a paycheck. They live to play. That's what they do. You know, I was falling apart in front of thousands of people.
for most of them, the idea of retirement or disability or end is unfathomable. I mean, they, they can't conceive of this. You get up in the morning and you are here for one purpose and that is to play. And not only that, it's not just financial and, and spiritual and what they get from it. Every part of their life revolves around this. All their friends, all their colleagues, their sense of self-worth, their sense of being a select individual, that this is someone who is not only very good at what they do, but exceedingly good at what they do. So then when this condition comes along, all that gets taken away like this. And, and the reason that I do the, the video is so you have kind of the backstory on me. But the but the video leaves you with a little bit of a mystery, right? It's like his career was over in 2002. Well, this is 11 years later. What did he do to get his music back? Maybe I should answer that question first, right? Are you curious? Yeah. Right. Okay. So I have a disability. I was diagnosed with this. And I'm gonna correct, someday I'm gonna correct the text on there. I don't call it incurable. I call it a yet to be cured disorder. And the problem isn't really in my hand. It's my, the problem with this disorder is where my mom always said it was with me, which was between my ears. <laughs> she said, your biggest problem is between your ears. You know what she was trying to get at? So, so I have this, this, this disorder and today my symptoms are as bad as they've ever been. Because I'm a, I'm a performing musician, that means the challenge to my business is as great as it's ever been, right here, right now, today, because my symptoms are as bad. What I've had to do since being diagnosed is to understand that there's life after diagnosis, there's life after a bad economy, that's what I call my dystonia. Have you ever heard that word dystonia before? You can't buy a plane ticket to dystonia people. It's not, a, it's not a country, it's a condition. And mine, again, it manifests in my hand, but the real problem is neurological. So what I had to do, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a piece that I've played thousands of times. I used to open up every performance when I was a healthy right-handed guitar player with this piece. And I've played it thousands of times as a right-handed guitar player. And the only way for me to play it for you today, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it the way I used to do it. What worked yesterday doesn't work in my business anymore today. What I have to do is, instead of holding my guitar this way, like I used to, what I did over those 11 years was to start over, turn everything upside down, remind myself what I always say, which is, what other people call unemployed, I call self-employed. <laughs> and I needed to reinvent my business. And I needed to do that and because my business is based on my ability as a musician. I had to start from scratch and rebuild from the ground up. And I'd love to share, is this a networking event? Is that what they call this? 
Well, if we're networking, then we're kind of a team, right? And I'm up here all by myself. It's kind of lonely up here. And I normally play this piece with an orchestra. In fact, you might have seen me um, on PBS recently. Has anybody seen my PBS special, a couple of you? Well, this piece I play with a full 21-piece orchestra, and they're not here with me today, but maybe you could pitch in just a little bit and help me with this. You don't have to sing. It's super easy. If you remember the Adams Family, <coughs> do, 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 do. that's your part. If you're up for it, you can put your coffee cups down. If you don't want to, you don't have to, but I will invite you, and I'll show you where to put it. My last name is McLaughlin. That's Irish, so this is going to have a Celtic kind of a beat to it, not an Adams Family beat. <laughs> this is called Into the Light. Let's cover a little bit of that real quickly. The 
because this is how I've differentiated myself from, from what other people do. And it became obvious to me very early on in my career, especially within the music business, which is based on creativity and differentiation, that I needed to follow my heart and, and chase after these sounds that I could hear on the guitar. When you sit very close to this instrument, you can hear the guitar do things. And in fact, if I had played this song a hundred years ago, it would have sounded like this. In this little room, right, you can hear that just barely, but not very well, can you? This is a very quiet instrument, isn't it? The guitar. Listen, everybody, I would just answer the age-old question for you that you've all wondered your whole life. Why is the guitar not in the orchestra? <laughs> it's simple. It's a simple reason. It's not loud enough. Put a violinist in here with me, and if I didn't have these speakers and a little bit of technology, right, I've had to learn how to use technology to expand my vision for my product, which is my music. Um, so, so what I'm doing is a little unusual. And, and, and thank you, Les Paul, if there's any guitar lovers out there that appreciate that name, Les Paul, he helped us uh, innovate the way that we amplify our instruments. What I'm doing, just so, you, so you're not anxious the rest of the morning, <laughs> I'll explain it. So I'm gonna take one finger, this is kind of like my Minnesota State Fair demonstration, you know, like the, the knife guy. Okay, <laughs> take my one finger, and I'll put my other hand behind my back, I'm gonna take one finger, I'm gonna find one string in one location, and I'm just gonna do this. So I didn't pluck it or just the force of hitting the string is enough to create the vibration. And that's how the string you know, creates the sound anyhow, is you just have to create vibration. So now I can hold the note as long as I want, or I can pick my finger up quietly, or I can, when I pick my finger up, watch this. Did you hear that other note? It's a two for one. It does look like a two for one. It took me three years. Wait a minute. <laughs> three. That's how hard it is for me. It took me three years to get diagnosed. And for three years, I went to doctor's offices and I said, hey, there's something wrong with my hand. And they did the x-rays and the MRIs. And they come back in the office and they say, well, we, we can't see anything wrong at all. And then they kind of tilt their head and they look at you and they say, do you think maybe you're a little stressed? You, and you leave, the, you leave the doctor's office thinking, I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. Now, three years into this process, I finally succumbed to the realization that I, I needed to go to a neurologist. And to me, if you said the word neurology, that sounds like too many other ologies that I don't want to talk about in the morning. <laughs> it's like, it sounded like a dirty word. But after being undiagnosed for three years and thinking I'm going crazy, I finally went to a neurologist and I walked in the room and this was at the Musicians Institute at Sister Kenny, right here in Minneapolis. And Dr. Janine Spear watched my fingers and she, she said, it took five seconds, she said, stop. I know what you have, you have focal dystonia. 
and I jumped up and I said, yay, I have something, you know, because here, in here the rumors had already started about what happened to Billy, how did he go from being on the charts to not being able to play his instrument. I was, I was failing miserably in public. I was embarrassing myself professionally, fighting something I didn't know what it was, and so of course, what would, especially with musicians, the assumption might be that Billy might have a problem with, right. uh, exactly. <laughs> and here I am going, no, there's something wrong with me. So here, she diagnoses me, I'm happy for about five seconds because right after that, she says, Billy, it's gonna get worse. And you need to think about what you're gonna do because you're not gonna be able to perform your music much longer. I could still kind of fight through some of my easier pieces. And I left I left that, that doctor's office in in the biggest state of denial that you could ever imagine a person. I, I walked out of there and I said, well I'm glad I have something, but I'm gonna fix this. There's gotta be a way to fix this. And I focused all my energy on this broken hand. Now that's right at the time. Do you remember that list that was on? That went down where it says, during, between this time he lost his record deal, his publishing deal, his distribution deal, his, his uh, income, his, his marriage, his family, his home. Okay, where that, that slide of a video came, actually came from a, a press release that I wrote. And my, my press release ended a little different. It went through the whole list, and at the very bottom it went dot, dot, dot. Shortly after that, Billy began having problems. <laughs> <laughs> For me, is that I love what I do. I love my job. I love it so much that I had to face this idea that maybe I was going to have to do something no one else has ever done before. At least I've never heard of a guitar player reaching a professional level in their career as a right-handed guitar player and potentially ending their career as a left-handed guitar player. I've never heard of that before. Well, just because it's never happened before doesn't mean it can't happen now. And I figured, well, I can either make history, at least personal history for me, which is the most important history any of us can make. I can either make history or I can make excuses. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. During that long list, I happened to write my very last piece of music as a right-handed guitar player. And I was convinced that this piece of music that I want to share with you right now was going to be my last piece of music. Because I could tell my skills were degrading and I've always used a, a, a hands-on approach when I compose. And, and I have just enough skill left and I pour myself into this piece and I'm trying to capture all of, of what was happening there. Now, you realize, uh, I just played a piece of music for you that had no words. How in the world can you understand what a composer might be thinking when there's no words to the song, right? Is there still meaning to the music? Yeah, but one important thing might be the title of the piece. So all this is happening in my life, that long list, and I pour myself into this, and I think this, okay, this is the end, this is my last piece, and I have to give it a really good title so people will understand it. And I think about it, and I think about it, I thought about it for two months. It took me two months to come up with the title of this piece, because it felt so important that I capture, you know, the drama of the moment. and. So this piece I want to share with you is called Hold On to Forever. Hold on to forever. I was trying to hold on to all those things that mattered to me so much. Hold on to forever. Hold on to forever. Man, that sounds like a Celine Dion song. <laughs> <laughs> you better be Celine Dion if, you, if you're going to do a piece called that. Well, let me, let me share it with you. I'll do a little, an abbreviated version of this for you because I don't want you to get too sleepy. Oh, 
normal guitar? You no. like the way the guitar sounds? Yeah, it's really big. Love that. I do too. I can't play the guitar. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I can still play the guitar. You know what I can still play on the guitar right-handed? Quick story. I'm a three-time failure at music. I failed at the piano when I was eight. I failed at the trumpet when I was about 10. And then I thought, well, shoot, I'm having trouble with the notes. I'll be a drummer. <laughs> and I joined the Holy Angels Drum Corps over in Richfield. And I, three, three practices into being a drummer, the director came and said, McLaughlin, you've got no sense of rhythm. Come back. <laughs> so I always say, three strikes and you're a guitar player. <laughs> So I go to my parents, I'm about 12, and I say, I, I need more, more lessons, I want to do guitar now, and they go, no. <laughs> I'm not doing any more lessons for you. You got to go, go to the library and get a book, and if you can teach yourself to play something on the guitar and show us that you're, 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 you've got some discipline and some commitment and persistence, then maybe we'll get you lessons. Now, here's the thing, in the music, world, when you're a professional musician, you know, your product is your ability to play. And orchestral musicians, if we just want to look at them as one part of the group, well, we can look at the Rolling Stones, too, um, <laughs> in the early 70s. But the truth is, an orchestral musician, and that's hard music, I mean, you have to be an amazing player to, to, to be in the Minnesota Orchestra or the St. Paul Chamber. Those players all have an expectation that they're going to be healthy enough have enough dexterity to play well into their 70s. Some players into their 80s. I saw Andre Segovia, the, the, the godfather of classical guitar, play a concert in his 90s. I mean, you're, you're talking about establishing a product line, you know, and carrying it on into your 90s. Wow, that's amazing. Well, here I was in my 30s, and I was falling apart with no, with no answer. So I want to show you what dystonia looks like real briefly. It's the third most common movement disorder in America behind Parkinson's and tremor, and yet very few doctors have even heard the word dystonia. Like I said, you can't buy a plane ticket there. Um, and so again, when I, so when I go to play, in fact, you can see a little bit of my tremor in my hand. That's not nerves or coffee. That's, that's part of the whole process with dystonia. But when I go to play, I can't keep these two things. They just curl right up. But I can still play the very first song that I learned from the book at the library when, when my parents said, you got to go teach yourself something. I got, here it is. It's not Kumbaya, you guys. You're going to know this. <laughs> And that's how we are used to hearing the guitar. So one of the things that I enjoy, and it's part of the way that I have found a way to kind of differentiate myself from other guitar players, is I like to let people hear the guitar all by itself. And I think it's a pretty cool sound. And I'm glad you guys like it too. Um, so that piece, Hold On to Forever, is, um, is fondly um, referred to by my, my kids when I, when I first started playing it at concerts, I was able to play it for about six months, and, and my kids used to come to the shows back then. And I'm driving to one of my shows, my little guy's in the back, and he says, Dad, I hope you play the new one. I love it. Hold on to whoever. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the same kid who, it was a couple weeks later. He says, Dad, I want to order my own McDonald's lunch today. Let me let me do it myself. I rolled down the window. That, May I help you? Welcome to McDonald's. He says, yeah, I want the frickin' nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now you know a little bit more.
more about me and, and, and my life. And I haven't had a chance to get to know many of you, and I want to open it up for questions in a little bit. And if there's some things you want to know about me, what part of what I think is important, one of the things that's become important for me to share is this idea that I, and I'm learning how to speak about my art in a business sense. And I've heard people say that business is art. Well, art is business too. And I'm realizing that when I say things like, I lost all my product integrity, what I meant was I lost my ability to play my music. And here I was in, in uh, 2002, as the video said, my business was done. I was out of business at that point. Now, how it is that in 2010, I was sharing this with my friend Linda, in 2010, you guys, if we look back historically to the years when I was on the billboard charts, and you look at my gross revenues from 1996 and 97, which were my two very best years, I tripled my gross revenues in 2010 from my very best year I ever had. Wow. Tripled them. And that year, you know what? I, my net was actually quadruple of my very best year from when life was good and I didn't have any problems in my life and I didn't have dystonia in my life. And I know that a lot of people feel challenged in whatever, maybe it's their personal life or their business life. And I'll tell, people always ask, Billy, what is it that helped you turn the corner? Well, I'll tell you what it is. I spent those three plus years focused solely on trying to fix what was broken. Thinking all day long about what was broken. And I, 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 I had gotten blinders on about what still worked. I had to quit thinking about what was broken. And I had to start thinking about what worked. And I had to give up being a perfectionist. You know, as a guitar player, you're up here all by yourself. And if you play a wrong note, everybody in the room knows who played it. So you think I have a perfectionist streak? You bet I do. But I also know this, and this is one of the things I love about music education. When you start teaching students, the very first day you get a room full of students, you give out all the instruments, guess what? Everyone sounds like crap. Every single person sounds terrible. And when I took this guitar in, this is a right-handed guitar, the, the, the pick guards down here. This is one of my old right-handed guitars. This is the guitar that when it really came clear to me what I was gonna have to do to reinvent my business and that I was gonna have to start and take every note I used to play with this hand and move it over here, and then take every note I used to play with this hand and move it over here. And I came to grips with that and I realized you can't just take a guitar and change where the strings are. You actually have to get the, 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 the guitar has to be reconstructed. Essentially, it's about $400 to change a right-handed guitar to a left-handed guitar. So, and I'll tell you what, after not working, do you think I had 400 bucks laying around? I didn't. But here I reemerge. My guitar repairman hadn't seen me in two years. He was one of the guys that was wondering too, what happened to Billy? And the first thing I say to him, I bring this guitar in and I lay it on the bench, I say, hey Ron, can you convert this guitar from a right-handed guitar to a left-handed guitar? And he looks at me and he says, sure I can do that. Who are you gonna give it to? Give <laughs> <laughs> you and you're gonna give it? I said, no. I had to, at that point, decide I was gonna share my story for the first time with somebody. And I'll tell you what, sharing the story of our businesses, sharing the story of who we are, I think is one of the big things that I've learned. It was shortly after that that I went online and announced to the world what was going on with me. And that was a turning point for my business. And the encouragement that I got from my fan base, like my existing customer base, most people all came out of the woodwork to say, go for it, Billy, go for it, go for it. And so what do you think? So I decided I'm gonna teach myself to play left-handed. You'd think I'd start with my easiest song, wouldn't you? No, no. 
Guess what I did? I started with the hardest one, and I'm, I want to close by playing just one last short little piece here. And there's a there's a, another little story that goes with this. So I get the guitar converted. I go home and I start going one. And every time I would move my new finger, the finger that used to play that note, on the other hand, would move. It's called near dystonia. I didn't even know what it was. And it was the weirdest feeling. I was like, okay, well, I've got something up there that <laughs> I gotta pull out or something like that. So, so I start literally one note at a time. I sound terrible. I'm frustrated because I've been so good at this in the past, you know? And now I gotta learn a whole new skill and I'm not good at it. And I can tell I'm not good at it. My kids can tell I'm not good at it. That's the funny thing about music. A three-year-old who might be in the room when a musician is having a bad day is gonna pull on their mom's sleeve and say, Mom, how, why does he sound terrible? <laughs> you know you're not even educated in music, but we know when we're not good, right? So here I am, I'm sounding terrible. I've invested thousands of hours. I, I started practicing five hours a day. And about 18 months into practicing five hours a day, I still couldn't play this first piece. And I got so frustrated one morning. I took this guitar, put it in a case, threw the case in the closet, kicked the closet door closed, sat down, realized what a waste of an investment I had. I just wasted 1,800 hours practically trying to learn this piece. And it was all wasted. Who am I kidding? It's impossible, it cannot be done. And I sat down on the couch and I realized, my God, I'm gonna to have to sell shoes for a living. And I, I wept, I, I wept. And then I looked up at the clock and I realized, oh, it's lunchtime. Maybe I should take myself out to lunch and cheer myself up. And that's what I did. I took myself out to lunch, my favorite little place. I had this most awesome chicken green curry. I don't know why, but chicken green curry cheers me up. It's so good for you too. And I'm in this little Thai restaurant in White Bear Lake, and I don't have a sweet tooth. I'm sharing a lot of personal info with you guys. I don't have a sweet tooth, so I never take those cookies, because I feel it's wasteful if you're not going to eat them, right? Well, that day, considering what had just happened, I figure I better take a cookie and get some advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guess what, you guys? The little piece of paper that came out of that cookie in 2001 is taped to the dashboard of a very sexy town and country minivan <laughs> out in the parking lot right now. I've held on to that piece of paper. It's been taped, okay, it's been taped to two other minivans before this one. I finally got a good one, but it's been moved. I've moved it. And the little, you want to know what the little piece of paper said? I'm going to tell you what, it knocked me out of my chair so unbelievably appropriate for me. It said, many people fail because they quit too soon. <laughs> and I went and fell out of my chair. <laughs> and I thought, what a perfect message. And I've thought about a lot of things about that message. I've realized that that little piece of paper didn't say, it did not say, many people fail because they're not talented enough. It did not say many people fail because they're not smart enough or good looking enough. It said something simpler than that. It said many people fail because they quit too soon. And I realized that I don't want to be that person. And so I got this guitar back out and I'm going to close with the very first song that I relearned as a, as a left handed guitar player. And I need to tell you this too. I tried so hard to get my music. In the publishing world, a placement is when your music is put into a movie or into a TV show, into a soundtrack. And I tried so hard back when I was a healthy guitar player to get my music to be used and never, ever got a placement once until just about a year and a half ago. I finally got my first placement, you guys. I, I thought my music would be great like in a Meryl Streep Anthony Hopkins, <laughs> dramatic movie. My first placement is the Purina One Dog Chow commercial. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And it's no small thing, you know, that's mailbox money. That's the best mailbox money I've ever had. And the greatest thing is they liked it so much they multi-purposed it for the Purina One half chow. <laughs> <laughs> for about a year and a half, this was on TV. I don't know, maybe some of you pet lovers might actually recognize this. We'll be someone to end with here. This is called Finger Dance. And, um, and, and then we can take some questions if there's time, if you guys gotta run and, and get going. Um, that's fine too. Um, before I start this, I do want to thank Mark and Danica and Sandra. Mm -hmm. Right? God, I was hanging on to those names. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I didn't want to drop those. But um, thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, again, like I said, we can do some questions or whatever you might. Want. This is called finger dance. <laughs>
problem that's being manifested. If you think about a large company that has part of the company over here that's not quite working right, and guess where the problem was? It wasn't there, it's up here. It's at top management level. <laughs> it's not these guys. Not, not, not really, but I'll tell you what. When you're a guitar player and your fingers stop working right, your stress level goes <laughs> right up. It's an area of, of the highest debate right now as to whether playing the instrument triggers it or the fact is that you're predisposed to it and playing an in instrument exposes it. Those are two very different things. And so um, dystonia has a lot of different forms. We've got genetic markers. We've got 18 <coughs> genetic markers now for different types of dystonia. I'm lucky I have it just in my hand. Uh, people who, who have writer's cramp, and I mean, we're talking severe writer's cramp where you see the person's hand go like this and they lose all their penmanship. And who knows, maybe Einstein might have had a hand dystonia. <laughs> That's focal dystonia. That's exactly what I have. Golfers who have trouble with their short game, they call it the yips. That's a form of dystonia. You can get dystonia in your neck. We have the, the, the diabolical nature of dystonia is such that I know really wonderful singers who have it in their vocal cords. And I always say, hey, I'll trade you yours for mine. Because if I can get it, they would trade theirs for yours too. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and if you know who Diane Ream is, she's a famous um, national public radio host that we don't get here in the Twin Cities, but she's a Washington, D.C. based, um, super famous across the country. She has what's called spasmodic dysphonia, which is dystonia in her vocal cords. So you can, you can get it. Know, we have people who have it in one leg in our support group. We've got people who have generalized dystonia and you would swear they have cerebral palsy. Because it looks like that. The entire body gets twisted. So it's really a, a mission of mine to make sure that awareness of this disorder improves worldwide. Have to report at nine o'clock anywhere, do you? <laughs> I love 
Thank you.